Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Julia Harrison, and I'm director of the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies, and I would like to welcome you all here this evening um, to the first of the North at Trent 2012 lecture series. And before we begin tonight with uh, both our speaker and uh, some other remarks, I would like to call on President Stephen Franklin to make a few remarks and welcome us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, and uh, welcome, everyone. This is a great pleasure for me to introduce the, uh, the series, and uh, Julia will return to uh, introduce our guest speaker for the evening. But I wanted to start with uh, just a few remarks about the, uh, the origin of the Roberta Bondar Fellowship. And uh, what happened, I think, was in the 1980s, there was a, uh, uh, a federal grant that was provided. It, was to what is now the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies. And it was to create a focus on Northern Studies at Trent University. And over that subsequent decade, there were a number of lectures and they were supported by these funds. Uh, each one brought to Trent to scholars and specialists in a range of academic fields with expertise on political, historical, social, cultural, and environmental issues in Northern Canada. The series itself was launched by Justice Thomas Berger, and uh, he's well known for his role in the uh, Northern history as the uh, chair of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry in the 70s. And I was thinking today as I noticed that another pipeline inquiry has uh, at least uh, resulted in some controversy uh, on the news today. I don't know if people have heard, but the Keystone Pipeline, which was proposed for the uh, movement of uh, oil sands uh, petroleum down, to, or a, a bitumen down to uh, a series of uh, refineries in Oklahoma and Texas, that that was delayed at least for a, another year while a, a new environmental assessment occurs. Uh, this series brought uh, some of Canada's most impressive Aboriginal leaders from the north to Trent, and uh, these included Matthew Kuhn Kum, who was a Trent graduate and a former Assembly of First Nations chief, uh, George Blondin, who is a respected Bene elder, politician and an author, and Governor General award-winning author jo Joseph Boyden, uh, and Mary Simon, who then later became Trent, Trent's Chancellor. Uh, in 2007, uh, to encourage new scholars in the field, uh, two faculty members, Peter Lafleur uh, from Geography, Peter's here tonight, and John Wadlin from Canadian Studies, uh, shifted the focus of this Northern Initiative. And uh, they created the Roberta Bondar Fellowship in Northern and Polar Studies, and recommended the establishment of a teaching and research award to bring to Trent for up to two years a new scholar whose research and teaching would focus on northern and polar regions. And the fellowship was named after Roberta Bondar, who was our chancellor, very popular, very generous chancellor at, uh, at Trent, concluded her term just as uh, I was arriving in 2008. Uh, but she has a very strong interest and commitment to Canada's north, and tonight we will welcome, Julia will provide the introduction of uh, Elise Legat, who is our Roberta Bondar Fellow for the next two years. Uh, before that introduction, I just would like to thank those who served on the uh, Roberta Bondar Selection Committee, which included Dr. Jillian Balfour from our Sociology Department, Dr. Lynn Davis from our uh, Indigenous Studies Department, and Jonathan Bordeaux from Cultural Studies, Stephen Bocking from uh, Environmental Resource Studies. Uh, the Undergraduate Department in Canadian Studies will be jointly hosting Elise, uh, the third Roberta Bondar Fellow, uh, over the course of the next two years, and she will teach undergraduate courses or one undergraduate course in Canadian Studies and be a resource for students and faculty at Trent with research interests in the North. And she will give two public lectures, and so I will now turn to Julia to formally introduce our guest and to uh, begin our first of the two lecture series. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Stephen and I are holding this microphone, and Elise will be wearing it, because we are being webcast to the globe as we speak, so it's all very exciting. Um, 
But thank you very much, Stephen. I want to begin by acknowledging our thanks to the Roberta Bondar Fellowship Fund, uh, the Undergraduate Department in Canadian Studies, the School of Graduate Studies, and Trail College. And I particularly also want to thank Kathy Scholl, who is the Administrative Assistant in the Frost Centre, for all of her hard work uh, and attention to making this evening and the entire North Lecture Series, which will unfold this term, I'm sure will come off smoothly entirely thanks to Kathy. Um, Tonight's talk uh, is uh, part of that series, but then uh, we'll also be hearing at the end of the talk about the Northern Studies Colloquium, uh, which is a student initiative, um, which is an important part of, of focusing and privileging uh, work that's going on at Trent on the North. But on behalf of the Frost Center and the Undergraduate Program in Canadian Studies, who are hosting the third Roberta Bondar Fellow, I would like to welcome you all here this evening. Dr. Elise Leggett was the unanimous choice of the selection committee for the third Roberta Bondar Fellowship, and she's an anthropologist who approaches her work from the premise that history, place, and knowledge systems are central to understanding and about how we leave, live our lives. They are key to understanding cultural and social processes, and particularly at the community level. Elise Leggett is committed to the principle that doing research that addresses community concerns will better inform academic and, science, and the sciences more broadly, and, and the theoretical understandings that they grapple with. In 2002, uh, based on over 10 years' work, grounded in this philosophy with her work with the Klitschko, or formerly dog group communities, she began work on her doctorate. And in 2008, she received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Her thesis was titled, Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire, on becoming and being knowledgeable among the Klitschko Dene. Dene. She worked with Tim Ingold, and for those of you in the field of Northern Studies and the Social Sciences and Anthropology will know of Tim's work, um, those of you in, in uh, uh, geography. And he also at Aberdeen has pulled together a very interesting and important collective of Northern scholars, which I think is a community that Trent should help um, think about emulating. Harvey Fite was, in fact, Elisa's external examiner, which is important in this context because Harvey Fite was one, spoke as part of one of the Northern Chair Lecture series, so yet another Trent connection. In her dissertation, Elise explored what it meant to say, as the elders did, quote, to be knowledgeable is to be from the land. This work built on her MA in anthropology from the University of Calgary, which was on the political analysis of a Northern Canadian community, and she began her work uh, as it, with a BA in archaeology from the University of Calgary. As an independent scholar and consultant for nearly 20 years in the Northwest Territories, much of her work with the Petron community, she has worked on a wide range of projects. These include the development of traditional knowledge research and, and a monitoring in collaboration with the Clicho community, which will be the substance of her talk tonight, documenting the rules and expectations governing behavior associated with caribou, She's worked on a project about uh, place names and stories as ind indicators of biogeographical knowledge. And worked on a large project about the caribou, but particularly uh, understanding caribou around what was then, uh, back in the late 90s, the proposed Divic diamond mine. She has taught in a range of institutions, the University of Aberdeen, Aurora College uh, in the Northwest Territories, which uh, at one time was teaching courses that, in fact, were accredited through Transnative Studies uh, pro program. Uh, the University of Calgary, and she's taught anthropology courses there, as well as outreach courses on local reserve communities. And she's given a range of uh, courses and seminars to various agencies in the government of the Northwest Territories. She has served as a cross-cultural advisor on the Mackenzie Valley uh, Environmental Impact Review. She worked as a Program and Research Director on Traditional Knowledge, a Traditional Knowledge and Heritage Program with the Treaty 11 Council. She was the Director of Policy and Planning in the Culture and Communications uh, within the Government of the Northwest, Northwest Territories. And she even served as the Assistant, uh, Acting Assistant Deputy Minister of Culture uh, in the Territories. She's presented at conferences uh, and in various fora, including Trent, when she visited us here a few years ago. Uh, at Calgary and Aberdeen at various conferences in the U.S., as well as very much in the communities within she, with she, whom she works in the North. 
Her thesis is coming out as a publication, as a book, called Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire, with uh, knowledge and stewardship among the Tlingcho, mm -hmm. and it will be produced by the, uh, published by the University of Arizona Press, and in the fall, her second talk will be based around that. There's a wide range of papers published, uh, many of them jointly authored with the community researchers she has trained, and with other academics who have traveled to the North to draw on her knowledge uh, of working with Indigenous communities in the Northwest Territories for over 20 years. As the Roberta Bondar Fellow, Dr. Leggett will be at TRAIL and Trent more broadly over the next two years. She will teach, as uh, Stephen mentioned, a course in Canadian Studies, uh, which she hopes to run as a field course in 2013. The fellowship will allow her to make connections in, with a range of students, both graduate and undergraduate, and faculty interested in field-based northern research. She will continue actively to work with her work with the Clicho communities throughout this time, uh, as well as spending time in the archives of the Smithsonian and a place that I love to, to spend time well in, as well in the Hudson's Bay Archives in Winnipeg. But the central focus of her work during the fellowship will be spent writing up for a wider audience at the direction of the elders she has worked with, much of the information she has collected with them over the last two decades. It is their desire to have this material known more widely. Elise Leggett has the privilege of fulfilling this request for them, and the Roberta Bondar Fellowship will provide her a space in the community to encourage her within this work. Please join me in welcoming her to Trent. Her inaugural talk tonight as part of the Roberta Bondar Fellowship is titled, Licho Deni, Monitoring the Land. Thank you, President Franklin. Thank you, Professor Harrison. I would also like to thank the Gordon Foundation, who funded the Clincho Government, and the World Wildlife Fund, who funded the Wekezi Renewable Resources Board. These organizations made it possible for Camila Nitsiza, Madeline Chocolate, and I to discuss the traditional monitoring with harvesters and elders in 2009, and to design the program in 2010. I am sorry my colleague, Rita Watrati, who is entrenched in the documentation of obs observations made through traditional monitoring, was unable to join me this evening. I would like to dedicate this talk to Harry Mantla, a Tlincho elder on the Regional Elders Committee with whom I work. Henry, Harry died suddenly of a heart attack on the day before yesterday. He was a full-time trapper, hunter, and fisher who was dedicated to helping at school so young Clincho could experience the Clincho way. Although I am sad to be missing his funeral, I am very happy to be here this evening. I am enjoying Peterborough. I have not seen much, but I have walked along a couple of your trails. I've come to think of walking trails as an important way of knowing a place, as it allows me to experience and watch my surroundings. I have, since arri arriving, been confused by your streets. However, in being lost, I have come across some very interesting cafes and some very good secondhand bookstores. Thank you for the honor of speaking to you this evening as the third Roberta Bondar Fellow. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the importance of listening to people who know a given environment. I will do this by discussing how and why Clincho elders that I work that with whom I work, decided to develop a program based on walking, watching, and sharing, often referred to in English as their traditional environmental monitoring system. This is a theme of discussion in the Canadian North, and in fact, I've heard similar discussions by Indigenous people across the circumpolar North, especially at climate change workshops. I will do this by first setting the scene, including the importance of place to identity. Secondly, I will provide you with a historical overview of the events that led to the decision by the Clincho Regional Elders Committee to, form a, to want to formalize their walking, watching, and sharing system of monitoring. And then I will explain how this is mandated in the Clincho Land Claim and Self-Government Agreement. Before I begin, I would like to clarify that the First Nations 
King Cho Denny of the Northwest Territories were formally known as the Dog Rib Denny until the settlement of their land claim and self-government agreement in, in 2005. I would also like to clarify that I use the term harvester to mean clean show hunters, fishers, trappers, berry pickers, and those who process meat, fish, hides, etc., in ways that are appropriate to their culture. Finally, I use both Treaty 11, which the clean show signed in 1921, and clean show land claim and self government agreement, which they signed in 2005. This can be confusing, as most First Nations in Canada have not had the opportunity to negotiate a comprehensive agreement if a treaty was signed. The Clincha were able to negotiate an agreement because the Denny of the Northwest Territories argued that the 1921 treaty was a friendship treaty. And although the federal government has never agreed that the treaty was a friendship treaty, in 1973 they did agree to negotiate Aboriginal rights on the crowns that the Denny were never, that the Denny never received the benefits set out in Treaty 11. As you can see from the map, there are four Clincho communities. And the Clincho communities are in the red dots in the pink area. There's three fly-in communities, Gamity, with a population of three, 350, Wukwiti, with a population of under 100, and Wati with a population of about 400. Bechiko is the only not fly-in community, and it has a population of about 1,500 and can be reached by the highway from Yellowknife, and on the same highway, they can travel to southern Canada. Clincho Lands, which is the pink area on the map, covers 39,000 square kilometers, which includes surface and subsurface rights. Wekizi, which is the area of the uh, blue purpley color on the map, is the area that is jointly managed by the federal, territorial, and clinical governments through the Wekizi Renewable Resources Board and the Wekizi Land and Water Board. Montfligogadeninkle, which is the large reddy uh, area, encompasses the area Monfui explained to the Federal Treaty Commissioner in 1921 was the place where they, the Tincho, belonged. This map is of the Tincho trail system within Tincho Neke, the place where the Tincho belong. And it is the same area as Monfui Goga de Ninkle. Tincho Neke is an old term and is used by older elders and again, it refers to the place where the Clincho belong. I use Clincho Neke because it is what the elders use and because it emphasizes that it is the place where the Clincho call home, even if their land base has become significantly smaller. During my first flights to the community of Gamati, which is where I started working in for the elders in 1993, I saw and marveled at the vastness and the amount of snow and ice in the winter, and in the, and in the summer I was struck by the continuous lakes that were connected by rivers and streams running through the boreal forest. During my flights to the tundra, I was fascinated at how the boreal forest became increasingly sparse, and at how the long eskers left by the retreating glaciers 8,000 to 10,000 years ago wound through the Muskegee area all of which is surrounded by large lakes. At first, I saw only the landscape. As I listened again and again to the Kincho elders' oral narratives, my mind slowly stopped seeing a static landscape and started seeing people traveling trails through Kincho Neke, the place where the Kincho belong. As shown on this map, trails extend into the tundra, north to the southern shores of Great Bear Lake, west into the lowlands along the Mackenzie River, and south to Great Slave Lake. These trails, along with the oral narratives, describe the extent of where Clincho travel and continue to walk and watch the land as they hunt, fish, trap, and gather, both in the boreal forest and on the tundra. In continuing to set the scene, let me tell you about an incident that exemplifies the importance of place to the Clincho. 
identity. In July 2002, I went along with some people who were duck hunting. I was in a boat with Charlie, a hunter in his late 50s, and a couple of young, of young a couple of teenage girls. The two young women were pressure, pressuring Charlie to take them to an island with the elders, take them to, the, to an island where the elders had always told them that they should stay away from in order not to bother those who had died there. The day was beautiful. There was not a cloud in the sky and Charlie had successfully shot several ducks. We were ready to stop for lunch. Charlie was heading for the spot where the others were already building a fire. The girls pressured Charlie, teasing him, saying he lived in the past and believed too much in the old ways, and that they had learned in school that the story was just an old legend. Finally, Charlie turned the boat towards the island, saying, I will take you there, but I will not walk on the island. As he turned towards the island, one small black thundercloud formed over the island. Thunder and lightning came from the cloud in an otherwise clear sky. The girls quickly changed their mind, exclaiming, Okay, okay, it's true. We believe the elders. Charlie once again turned his boat and headed towards the other who were preparing food and tea. I listened while the older of the two girls told of our experience. As is so prevalent, she told of how, how her grandmother, Marie Zoe, had told her of the island and that she must never walk on it. She recounted everything, including our trip up the rapids that day, leading up to her and her friend pushing Charlie to take them to the island. While telling of Charlie's final willingness to take them, and not, but not to walk on the island with them, she exclaimed how, explained how calm the, isle, the lake was and how the, cl how the cloud, lightning, and thunder had suddenly appeared, and how she and her friend now know the story is true and have decided to pay attention to the elders. The elders sat and the elders sat quietly at that time and listened to them, then simply stated that it was right to listen to the elders. It is right to follow the ancestors' footprints. As the elders finished eating, they told similar stories. We all listened while eating our fish and duck. Philip So, one of the girl's fathers, father, shared his experience of seeing the northern lights go into the water and cause a whirlpool when he was traveling on a lake north of Gamete, and how Zimmy, the, the leader, told them, not to, told them to go ashore so that the interaction between the spirits of the northern lights and water could be left alone. After Philip's story, the elder Liza Mantla began swimming, singing love songs, not swimming, but singing love songs. I asked why she sang to a place rather than to an individual. She said, because the place makes you. And then smiling, she began teasing Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie. She said, sing to Gamity. That's where Ili belongs and grew from. For me, these stories in Liza's love song encapsulates how the Klincho, human being and other, other than human beings belong to places. And these places and the people who belong there are to be respected. Marie's love song to a place emphasizes the importance of the, of the identity that comes from glo growing in a place just, such as Klincho Necker. I want you to hold on to the idea that people grow from places and that Klincho Necker is where the Klincho belong. It is who they are. I am now going to talk about the events leading up to the elders deciding to develop a monitoring, watching the environment program that would, ha that would help ensure their observations were recognized in the, and that the information they provided you would be used in land management decisions. To do this, I must go back in time and give you a bit of a historical perspective. The Federal Treaty Commissioner traveled to Kinshoneke immediately after the discovery of oil in 1920 near Norman Wells, Northwest Territories. The federal government wanted Treaty 11 signed. They wanted the land ceded to them. However, that was not the beginning of the federal government controlling Denny lives. Federal legislation and policy was already affecting Denny lives prior to 1921. Take, for example, the Northwest 
Game Act of 1917 that stipulated a closed season on caribou between October and November and from the beginning of April to the end of July. The policy stipulated that Klincho, who are caribou hunters, could only take caribou to prevent starvation. In conjunction with this, the Migratory Bird Convention Act, also of 1917, effectively denied Northern Na Northern Native Northerners legal access to most species of game bird, birds that they depended on during the spring and fall when caribou were unavailable, and it was difficult to get their fish nets into the water due to the fall freeze-up and spring breakup. The Clincho elders share their memories of these events through oral narratives, just as they remember being told in the 1960s that they were not to kill caribou cows for conservation reasons. A similar stipulation was made in 2010 after the Bathurst caribou hearing held by the Wekezi Renewable Resources Board. In both the 1960s and in 2010, the elders and hunters are, were concerned, are and were concerned because the bulls which cannot be hunted, protected the females and cows. The females and cows, they are cows. The females and calves, excuse me. The Clincho elders under, understand the unpredictability, the Clincho elders understand the unpredictable caribou migration patterns. They understand the caribou go where their winter habitat is lush. They also know that periodically, especially when their population numbers are low, caribou will move around, change calving locations. For this reason, they do not refer to them by their herd name, except for the benefit of non clincho They refer to them as barren ground caribou, as opposed to woodland caribou. They also understand the impacts of mines on the caribou and, the re and other resources they depend on. Most of you have heard about the large diamond mine on the tundra but mining in Tincho Nekeha has been taking place since the 30s and 40s, when 20 mines were operating within Tincho Nekeha. Tincho elders have been observing occurrences associated with these mines since then. They have watched the relationship between loss of caribou habitat, they have watched the relationship between loss of caribou habitat and mining, and the impacts of contaminants from the tailings in the water on the fur-bearing animals, fish, and on their own people. Currently, Ray Rock, where uranium was mined in the 1950s and where radioactive hotspots continue to be reported, is the most discussed by the elders. They are talking about it because it, show, it is located close to the Fortune Minerals uh, uh, NICO project. And you can see it. Um, I've got arrows pointing to, to that area. Both these mines are located on the Ida Trail, the main trail that, tra that goes up through Tinchonekea, where numerous significant locations are used. The elders want the land to be watched by their own people. Research is also historically significant when considering why the elders wanted the environmental monitoring system to become a, for a formal program. And by environmental monitoring, I mean watching, observing, experiencing, and sharing in their own way. The, De the Dene have been instigating participatory and collaborative research for several decades. For example, Tincho leaders and elders were instrumental in insisting that the West Katikmit Slave Studies Society, which took place, the research through them took place between 1996 and 2002, and the, so the Klincho elders and leaders were instrumental in insisting that that organization include traditional knowledge research and that it be, be funded equal to any scientific studies. The West Katikmit Slave Studies Society was formed to document baseline information for future monitoring the impacts of development. The society consisted of representatives from the territorial and federal governments, the Chamber of Mines, Aboriginal parties, uh, specifically the Inuit, Tincho, Chippewan, and Métis. Now, also in discussing research, uh, it, it's important to remember that uh, anthropologists such as June Helm and Joan Ryan, 
who began their work uh, with the Qingcho in the 1950s in uh, Wati, were also instrumental in how the elders from the Regional Elders Committee wanted work done and why they wanted this monitoring program in place in a formal way. Both Helm and Ryan were immediately recruited when they went to Wati to assist young people with their reading and writing uh, skills so that they could stay home with their families instead of going to the federally approved Catholic residential schools. So in addition to doing their research, they were involved in the community by supporting what the community needed. As, and it is also important to remember that they, the elders remember these researchers as being people that were committed to informing community members about their research and that they both supported the communities in their endeavors to deal with the federal government and related impacts on their, on, on Klingcho Nekha, especially those that occurred in the 1960s with the new highway that connected uh, Yellowknife and Bechico and connected the south to the north, uh, the Northwest Territories, and as well as government policies relating to renewable resources and social services. Both Ryan and Helm supported local people to carry out their own research. Helm de designed field research to be carried out by local people while she worked with the Indian Brotherhood of the Northwest Territories, now the Denny Nation. The, project, the project's aim was to reestablish Denny control over land use and development through negotiations and the ju judicial process. In the 1980s, Ryan worked closely with the elders and leaders and trained local researchers in Wati to work on the traditional justice project that was designed to support the territorial government to make legislation and policy changes to the justice system, i.e. sentencing circles, and also the traditional medicine project so that traditional medicine could be recorded and documented in a way that uh, people uh, could use it in universities or their own people could use it in universities and um, people would recognize it for what it was, for what it is. And that, yet another example of practicing and practical research in Kincho uh, Nekke is associated with uh, Leslie Saxton, a linguist from the University of Victoria. Saxton has, has assisted the Klincho Community Services Agency to develop a Klincho language program and has been instrumental in the upkeep of the web-based dictionary and assisting with the spelling of place names to ensure that they reflect their true meaning. Uh, the resulting uh, report on place names was tied very closely to our research on place names as indicators of biogeographical knowledge. Within this framework, research framework, I was involved with a traditional governance project that was done at the same time as the Tincho Agreement was being negotiated and two research projects designed for future environmental monitoring. These were the elders' knowledge of caribou migration and the state of caribou habitat and the place names project, all of which were projects initiated by the elders and I was brought on to train research and to form to, re, to train researchers and to, to formalize the research pro, process in their communities. The Clean Show Elders' experience with academics has been a good one because they have been people who are interested in using their skills to support what communities want. Not, they have not experienced very few, they've experienced very few who want to rush in, do a short-term project and rush out again. The information I have just given you is what the senior elders remember when they asked in 1999 to meet with four elders and two harvesters from each community. They requested that the group be half men and half women from each community. When the ice roads were open between the communities, the group traveled to Gamati. We met in the elder Romy Watradi's cabin for four days. They talked with a focus on their concerns about development the increase in number of forest fires, and the lack of respect for the other than human beings, which was for the elders obvious given the location of development in the habitats needed for the, survive, needed for the survival of these beings. And they were particularly concerned with the uh, 
key areas where the development was occurring that the caribou used in the, in the summer where the calves put on weight and uh, so do the cows. This group, uh, the elders regional committee, as well as the ex additional elders and the harvesters from each of the communities, was also concerned that decisions were being made based on data collected from plane-based surveys and satellite callers on caribou. They thought scientists were becoming too disconnected from the land, did not walk on the land, so they could not observe, could not really know. They thought science provided limited understanding of the relationship and interconnectedness of all beings. Please note that the elders do not dislike science. They are perfectly respect, they respect science. They just think it's limited. They focused on caribou through these discussions. They were concerned that many people no longer respect caribou, of which knowing caribou is key. This group of elders and harvesters thought that if people really knew caribou, they would not be building mines where the caribou needed grasses, sedges, and lichens for themselves and the calves to grow, to grow strong. They felt that when walking and watching, indicators of, of impacts on the land would be recognized early and then could be dealt with more efficiently. They exemplified this by talking about the dust and airborne pollutants that settled on plants and in the water. On the fourth day, this group of elders and harvesters decided to take action to deal with their concerns. The elders wanted the harvesters, both men and women, to watch and share their observations and experiences in a more formalized process. They wanted to hear from the harvesters how, how the tracks of caribou looked as well as the trails of the caribou. They wanted to know from the harvesters when the caribou last passed through an area, what vegetation was in their stools, if they were using particular trails, what they were finding in the caribou uh, that they were hunting, was in, what was in their mouths, what vegetation was in their mouths. They wanted to hear about the hides and the meat from the men and the women. They wanted to hear about the fish that they depended on when the caribou were not available. Of course, the elders were already hearing all of this information. So what they really wanted to hear when the younger generation was, they wanted to hear this when the younger generation could also be documenting it so that the younger uh, generations could be hearing it as well. They wanted what the harvesters were observing documented. And they wanted the younger generation to document what the elders had observed in the past so that they could do, they could think about what was in the past and what was in the present. And they wanted everyone to learn from each other so that the oral narratives would be meaningful. And they wanted them to continue sharing the oral narratives of what they had observed even if they were being documented because they wanted them to be continually going around the community. Charlie, the same hunter who was, who was, who had taken us duck hunting, said, I know places, he was at, he was at the meeting and what he said was, I know places from my father. Other men my age know places I have only heard stories about. If we are to go to other regions to observe the land, the elders and hunters who know the place will have to walk with us so that we also can know, so we can pass the knowledge on to those of the next generation. That was a common theme. These men and women are, are acutely aware that it is their responsibility to pass their pre predecessors' knowledge on so that Qingchou in the future can watch and make decisions about Qingchou Nekhe. They directed us all to develop a process to ensure that their knowledge and observations, their knowledge and observations and that of those who are walking the land, the harvesters, uh, would be documented. They directed us to find a way to find those youngers, they directed us to find ways to include those younger and to involve them in the documentation and to ensure the youth were learning the oral narratives so that they could use them to think with in the future. The leaders and land claim, land claim negotiators also wanted both the uh, knowledge to be used in decision making. The legislat 
the legislated clincher land claim and self-government agreement states that both scientific and clincher knowledge be used in management plans associated with wildlife, plants, and forest management, and the management of protected areas, if available. They're supposed to both be used if available. The challenge, and although it's available in oral form, uh, when you get to a hearing, you need that information in a written form, and the elders were were very aware that that's what they needed to do is to take that step and use their own people to put it in a written format. The challenge to using their knowledge in the environmental mm -hmm. management uh, are numerous. However, for the elders in 1999, there was one that was pressing. Across Canada, traditional knowledge is tacked on to scientific studies. And you can see here, I've got the process in this, in this slide where you actually have the caribou. You put the collars on the caribou. It's scientists putting the collars on the caribou. And you might take some young um, Aboriginal uh, people along with you and one or two elders. You then, uh, do, you then make, uh, look at where the caribou have traveled. And in this case, there were six cows. And then you look at the distribution and then you make uh, decisions. You, you provide that information to the management uh, boards and they make, they make recommendations on which decisions are made. So as you can see in this slide, the current process is to take um, an elder along and some youth so that they can learn scientific knowledge and also listen to their elders in the context of scientific research, integrating traditional knowledge and science. However, the process does not capture the depth of traditional, of traditional knowledge known by First Nations. <laughs> However, let me just repeat that. However, the process does not capture the depth of knowledge known by First Nations about the land. The process simply means that they are going along to help and learn. The elders and harvesters, the Clincho elders and harvesters, wanted their observations to be documented in a manner that reflects their knowledge system. They devised a monitoring system based on walking and young people learning from those with more experience while drawing on the skills of everyone. All generations would be involved. The middle-aged would learn from the elders and walk and observe and tell stories of their observations to the elders who would weave it back to determine if their observations were consistent with change that they had heard about in the past or if the change was new. Then they could decide you know, what steps had to be taken. Those youngers, younger would hear the narratives, providing them with the information they, that would enable them to walk the land in their predecessors' footprints in the future. So you can see that process right here. There's the, there's the caribou, and then the elders, uh, or the hunters watching it. There's some harvesters both men and women, there's some young people working on documenting it, and there they are at the top, uh, all the elders going back and talking about it. There's also uh, maps through GIS that are, that are made nowadays. In 2008, the elders' concern and solutions were presented to the Klincho Chief Executive Council and the Wekazi Renewable Resources Board, mandated, who's mandated under the Klincho Agreement. The board and the Clincho government decided to work together to ensure the program was developed. <clears throat> After the Bathurst Caribou hearings held by the Wekazi Renewable Resources Board in 2010, they recommended to use both the GNWT and the Clincho government. They recommended to both the GNWT, the government of the Northwest Territories, and the Clincho government that both science and Clincho knowledge be used to monitoring the caribou using the tr traditional methods suggested by the elders. So you can see the process here. The process has been set up and the work has begun. Walking and watching the land, however, is not about boxes and lines. It is about two very good knowledge systems and how the people involved go after understanding and solving problems. In the 1960s, Chief Jimmy Bruno directed the Tincho people to learn both ways so that each individual will be strong like two people. This motto is in their school and is reflected in the agreement 
through their respect of using both ways and using both knowledge systems, the one of the dominant society and their own knowledge system, the use of TK and in scientific information. The parallel process of knowing two ways is about respecting each other's knowledge system and the perspective and the assumptions we make and carry with us and the laws we choose to live by. The elders I had the privilege to work with wanted this to be realized, to have their knowledge system to be recognized, not just to be tacked on to the system of the dominant society. And that's what you see here. It's about people and doing their, uh, what they know best within their own knowledge system and then coming together and sharing that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, okay. But what you, you did actually get that it was for the younger people first, right? Yes. Okay. So what they want is for the information to be documented and certainly that, the stories, they do not want them translated. They want any, and I'm getting to your, getting to it. They want it left in Klingcho so that anybody who doesn't speak Klingcho or, or young people who are struggling with their language have to work with the language speakers so that they will learn. They will learn not only the language but the concepts that are in the, in the stories. That is one thing that they want. Secondly, they want those young people, um, and when I say young people, I mean, you know, under 50. <laughs> I'm, I'm using it the way the elders do. The, they want them to start writing more and more reports, and those reports would then go to the land department within the Clincho government, as well as probably um, uh, then the land department would distribute them to whoever uh, needed that information, like the boards, uh, is sometimes industry. <coughs> so, but you know, if you're wondering about the actual original, no, that's for the Clincho. And most of us who work with the Clincho have, have been asked not to take that information out of Clincho territory. Is that, does that, is that clear? Yeah, so it will be, uh, it will be available. Anybody else? I'm sorry, the, the question is, what is the language like and is it difficult to learn? Well, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a very uh, slow learner, for, so for me, yes, it's very difficult to learn. But for Leslie Saxon, she speaks it quite well. And um, I think it's completely different than, would, there's some, <laughs> would you like to answer that question? Would, would you like to answer that question, what, what is the language like? <clears throat> yeah, that's what the question was. Was that? I'm sorry. Okay, let me just repeat that, okay? And the, 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 the answer, of course, was that it's, um, it's very, it is difficult because it's completely different than what, than what we know. But if you have the opportunity and the drive uh, that, that it's possible to learn it. Personally, for me, if I was to learn it, and I would like to still do this, is to go off with somebody who does not speak English for, for three to six months. And I think that I, I would learn it because I like talking. So, okay. Okay, your question? Um, yeah, um, what was the last time you were in the north and uh, what do you see as a future in the direction of the large population of the people that are in my generation or under 25? What do you see as the direction and future of the people in the north? Whoa. So the question is, when was I in the north last and what do I see as the direction for young people? That are living in the north and that are in the south. Okay. What do I see for the young people? Um, I'm on the I was 
I left the North on the 2nd of January. So, <laughs> so I was just there. <laughs> and um, what do I see? Well, I, I think it's a mixed bag, what's, what's coming up for the young people. I see some incredibly, I mean, a lot of the young people in the Clinch communities were raised by their grandparents. And so there, there's some very dynamic young people and very determined young people and, and um, uh, really uh, directed and really care about what's happening in the communities, what's happening in the north, and what's happening in the world. There's a lot of uh, young Clean Show, uh that, that I know that are traveling a lot. They're traveling to Poland and Turkey. But you know, traveling for the Clean Show is to learn. I mean, I didn't talk about that, but I mean, when you travel, you're learning and you're experiencing and you're, and you're learning about other people and then you bring that back and you tell the stories. There's, there's a whole other um, uh, uh, group that I don't know very much about where people, not just in the Clincho communities, but throughout the North that are struggling with, uh, with the effects of a lot of money that have come into the North and, and with that brings alcohol and drugs and um, abusive uh, behavior towards themselves mainly. And that's in, I think, not just the, the in Clincho communities, that's really, I see it a lot in Yellowknife too. So I think it's a mixed bag, but I personally see some very strong young people coming up and very interested in the politics and very determined and really communicating with each other. I think it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the images that are being put on the screen. And obviously you haven't gone through them all. There's an interesting mixture of photographs and maps. And those maps seem to me quite scientific. And I presume they've been made by an agency. Who made, who made those maps? Do they, do they represent a sort of native view or outsider's view? Those maps are signed, that were made by the uh, uh, department, the government, the GNWT, because they're based on their satellite images. These maps, th those trails were um, documented by the Denny Mapping Project uh, in the 70s. Um, but uh, there was uh, Sally Ann Zoe was the person who did our GIS uh, when we were, I didn't show any of her work, but she she documented all of the information on the GIS and was starting to make maps. Yes, we had people come in and, and help train, but she actually did the work. And it was very interesting when we started working with the GIS because I explained the process as I understood it, and I'm not a GIS person, to the elders. And, they, and most of the elders we worked with were over certainly over 78, because they were determined <laughs> to make things happen. And I talked about how they were layering and all of this different stuff. They got it, like, right away. They had no problems with the concepts, and they, because they're not afraid of new technology. They're not afraid of having their, being open to new ways of looking at the world. Like Anne Gunn, a biologist that works in the north, often goes in to the homes and talks about uh, satellite, the use of, of uh, collars on caribou. They don't agree with it. They think it's disrespectful, but they, they, they value the fact that she's willing to talk about it to them, and they, and they, which means that they can understand and comprehend it. So no, nothing that we did in our projects goes outside. If somebody wants to work with us, they have to come into the communities. So we do bring in specialists, yeah, to help train people. Hmm? Yes?
No, that's interesting. The way I understand the question is that you're wondering how I, how I see this uh, Clincho environmental monitoring process working within the British legal system. Sure. Which is, <laughs> to sum it up, right? Yeah, well that's, <laughs> it's a, I was at that hearing too. So it was, um, it's, it's certainly a challenge. The challenge will not be to get the work done. The challenge will not be to actually document it. The challenge will be to, her, to be heard. Now, um, the thinking is that if, if the younger people can be the people who are presenting and have that hour and a half, the same as uh, Jan did, that then, and, and present it in a way that white folks can hear it, right? And uh, it will it will mean that they will they will be heard. Now the problem with that, of course, is that you have to change your language, which means you change your concepts, so that you can be heard. So, what does that do? If not right away, what does it do down the road? And and that's something that we are struggling with and talking about. And that's why the elders have not said this to me. I'm I'm assuming this is why they want the stories to be learned by the young people in in their own language if possible even if it's just a few and they don't want the stories translated so i think i think it's going to be um, a lot it's going to take time to do this but just even getting started has has been has been um, helpful, but yeah, I mean, if you were at that hearing, you saw that the elders were getting eight minutes to speak at that hearing. Well, if you were actually registered, you got uh, uh, an equal amount of time. But the 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 issue is that the public doesn't always register. To have a slot to be spoken, to, to to be heard in their speaking, and so they were they were put. There were certain days that they were they were uh, assigned, and there was a lot of people that that wanted to speak. So it came down to eight minutes per person. So it's really hard for an elder to speak in eight minutes. I think any of us, it's hard for any of us to speak to say what we have to say in eight minutes. D does that answer your? We're struggling with that, but we're started. Um, could you repeat that again, please, just so that I can sum it up for the... How, how important do you see the community-driven aspect of managing the system? Well, you know, well, the own language, uh, very much in control of how traditional knowledge is being utilized. Uh, how, how important do you see that to, to being effective in the co-management co process where they have to deal with Well, you know, um, okay. Is when something is driven by the community at the community level, how effective is that in the larger context, such as the co-management uh, regimes? Um, you know, what I've seen since I've been in the north is that uh, there's a, a couple of steps forward and then a couple of steps backwards. And, you know, certainly when uh, Tom Berger was, was, it was a hearing and it, it is different, but he was willing to listen to everything that people had to say. Uh, we seem to be, this period of our, our, our time here on earth seems to be very rushy. 
and we don't have time to listen to each other. And um, so, so right now, I think that 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 a lot of the traditional knowledge is being done for. Um, okay, we have to do that because it's it's one of the rules and regulations that we have we have to do, and we have to listen to that. But I think that. With processes like this happening at the community level, it will continue to push, and and there will be, I think there will be change when people actually see that it brings to the table uh, information that maybe wouldn't have gotten before that we wouldn't have gotten if we hadn't listened. Um, but but I think that it's going to be something that we can't give up on. I think it's going to be a long road. But now listen, I didn't I didn't say this in my talk, and I'm not sure why I didn't. The the WRB, the Wekizi Renewable Resources Board, made recommendations to both the Klinsho government and uh, the GNWT that this process needed to be used for monitoring caribou now. So they too recognized that eight minutes was not enough. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Stephen and I are holding this microphone, and Elise will be wearing it, because we are being webcast to the globe as we speak, so it's all very exciting. Um, but thank you very much, Stephen. I want to begin by acknowledging our thanks to the Roberta Bondar Fellowship Fund, uh, the Undergraduate Department in Canadian Studies, the School of Graduate Studies, and Trail College. And I particularly also want to thank Kathy Scholl, who is the Administrative Assistant in the Frost Center, for all of her hard work uh, and attention to making this evening and the entire North Lecture Series, which will unfold this term, I'm sure will come off smoothly entirely thanks to Kathy. Um, Tonight's talk uh, is uh, part of that series, but then uh, we'll also be hearing at the end of the talk about the Northern Studies Colloquium, uh, which is a student initiative, um, which is an important part of, of focusing and privileging uh, work that's going on in Trent on the North. But on behalf of the Frost Center and the Undergraduate Program in Canadian Studies, who are hosting the third Roberta Bondar Fellow, I would like to welcome you all here this evening. Dr. Elise Leggett was the unanimous choice at the selection committee for the third Roberta Bondar Fellowship, and she's an anthropologist who approaches her work from the premise that history, place, and knowledge systems are central to understanding and about how we leave, live our lives. They are key to understanding cultural and social processes, and particularly at the community level. Elise Leggett is committed to the principle that doing research that addresses community concerns will better inform academic and the sciences more broadly, and, and the theoretical understandings that they grapple with. In 2002, uh, based on over 10 years' work, grounded in this philosophy with her work with the Klitschow, or formerly dog group communities, she began work on her doctorate. And in 2008, she received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Her thesis was titled, Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire, on becoming and being knowledgeable among the Klitschow Dene. Dene. She worked with Tim Ingold, and for those of you in the field of Northern Studies and the Social Sciences and Anthropology. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Julia Harrison, and I'm director of the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies. And I would like to welcome you all here this evening um, to the first of the North at Trent 2012 lecture series. And before we begin tonight with uh, both our speaker and uh, some other remarks, I would like to call on President Stephen Franklin to make a few remarks and welcome us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, and uh, welcome, everyone. This is a great pleasure for me to introduce the, uh, the series, and uh, Julia will return to uh, introduce our guest speaker for the evening. But I wanted to start with uh, just a few remarks about the, uh, 
the origin of the Roberta Bondar Fellowship. And uh, what happened, I think, was in the 1980s, there was a, uh, uh, a federal grant that was provided. It was to what is now the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies. And it was to create a focus on Northern Studies at Trent University. And over that subsequent decade, there were a number of lectures, and they were supported by these funds. Uh, each one brought to Trent to scholars and specialists in a range of academic fields with expertise on political, historical, social, cultural, and environmental issues in northern Canada. The series itself was launched by Justice Thomas Berger, and uh, he's well known for his role in the uh, northern history as the uh, chair of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry in the 70s. And I was thinking today as I noticed that another pipeline inquiry has... Uh, at least uh, resulted in some controversy uh, on the news today. I don't know if people have heard about the Keystone Pipeline, which was proposed for the uh, movement of uh, oil sands uh, petroleum down to, or uh, a bitumen down to uh, a series of uh, refineries in Oklahoma and Texas. That that was delayed at least for another year while a, a new environmental assessment occurs. Uh, this series brought uh, some of Canada's most impressive Aboriginal leaders from the north to Trent, and uh, these included Matthew Kuhn Kum, who is a Trent graduate and a former Assembly of First Nations chief, uh, George Blondin, who is a respected Dene elder, a politician and an author, and Governor General award-winning author jo Joseph Boyden, uh, and Mary Simon, who then later became Trent, Trent's Chancellor. Uh, in 2007, uh, to encourage new scholars in the field, uh, two faculty members, Peter Lafleur uh, from Geography, Peter's here tonight, and John Wadlin from Canadian Studies, uh, shifted the focus of this northern initiative. And uh, they created the Roberta Bondar Fellowship in Northern and Polar Studies and recommended the establishment of a teaching and research award to bring to Trent for up to two years a new scholar whose research and teaching would focus on northern and polar regions. And the fellowship was named after Roberta Bondar, who was our chancellor, very popular, very generous chancellor at, uh, at Trent, concluded her term just as uh, I was arriving in 2008. Uh, but she has a very strong interest and commitment to Canada's north. And tonight we will welcome, Julia will provide the introduction of uh, Elise Legat, who is our Roberta Bondar fellow for the next two years. Uh, before that introduction, I just would like to thank those who served on the uh, Roberta Bondar Selection Committee, which included Dr. Jillian Balfour from our Sociology Department, Dr. Lynn Davis from our uh, Indigenous Studies Department, and Jonathan Bordeaux from Cultural Studies, Stephen Bocking from uh, Environmental Resource Studies. Uh, the Undergraduate Department in Canadian Studies will be jointly hosting Elise, uh, the third Roberta Bondar Fellow, uh, over the course of the next two years, and she will teach undergraduate courses or one undergraduate course in Canadian Studies and be a resource for students and faculty at Trent with research interests in the North. And she will give two public lectures, and so I will now turn to Julia to formally introduce our guest and to uh, begin our first of the two lecture series. Anthropology will know of Tim's work, um, those of you in, in uh, uh, geography. And he also at Aberdeen has pulled together a very interesting and important collective of Northern scholars, which I think is a community that Trent should help um, think about emulating. Harvey Fite was, in fact, Elise's external examiner, which is important in this context because Harvey Fite was one, spoke as part of one of the Northern Chair Lecture series, so yet another Trent connection. In her dissertation, Elise explored what it meant to say, as the elders did, Quote, to be knowledgeable is to be from the land. This work built on her MA in anthropology from the University of Calgary, which was on the political analysis of a northern Canadian community. And she began her work uh, as it, with a BA in archaeology from the University of Calgary. As an independent scholar and consultant for nearly 20 years in the Northwest Territories, much of her work with the Petron community, she has worked on a wide range of projects. These include the development of traditional knowledge research and, and a monitoring in collaboration with the Clito community, which will be the substance of her talk tonight, documenting the rules and expectations governing behavior associated with caribou. She's worked on a project about uh, place names and stories as ind indicators of biogeographical knowledge. 
and worked on a large project about the caribou, but particularly uh, understanding caribou around what was then, uh, back in the late 90s, the proposed Divic Diamond Mine. She has taught in a range of institutions, the University of Aberdeen, Aurora College uh, in the Northwest Territories, which uh, at one time was teaching courses that, in fact, were accredited through Transnative Studies uh, pro program. Uh, the University of Calgary, and she's taught anthropology courses there, as well as outreach courses on local reserve communities. And she's given a range of uh, courses and seminars to various agencies in the government of the Northwest Territories. She has served as a cross-cultural advisor on the McKinsey Valley uh, Environmental Impact Review. She worked as a program and research director on traditional knowledge, a traditional knowledge and heritage program with the Treaty 11 Council. She was the director of policy and planning in the culture and communications uh, within the government of the Northwest, Northwest Territories. And she even served as the assistant, uh, acting assistant deputy minister of culture uh, in the territories. She's presented at conferences uh, and in various fora, including Trent, when she visited us here a few years ago, uh, at Calgary and Aberdeen at various conferences in the U.S., as well as very much in the communities within she, with she, whom she works in the North. Her thesis is coming out as a publication, as a book, called Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire, with uh, knowledge and stewardship among the Tlingcho, mm -hmm. and it will be produced by the, uh, published by the University of Arizona Press and in the fall, her second talk will be based around that. There's a wide range of papers published, uh, many of them jointly authored with the community researchers she has trained, and with other academics who have traveled to the North to draw on her knowledge uh, of working with Indigenous communities in the Northwest Territories for over 20 years. As the Roberta Bondar Fellow, Dr. Leggett will be at TRAIL and Trent more broadly over the next two years. She will teach, as uh, Stephen mentioned, a course in Canadian Studies, uh, which she hopes to run as a field course in 2013. The fellowship will allow her to make connections in, with a range of students, both graduate and undergraduate, and faculty interested in field-based northern research. She will continue actively to work with her work with the Clicho communities throughout this time, uh, as well as spending time in the archives of the Smithsonian and a place that I love to, to spend time well in, as well in the Hudson's Bay Archives in Winnipeg. But the central focus of her work during the fellowship will be spent writing up for a wider audience at the direction of the elders she has worked with, much of the information she has collected with them over the last two decades. It is their desire to have this material known more widely. Elise Leggett has the privilege of fulfilling this request for them, and the Roberta Bondar Fellowship will provide her a space in the community to encourage her within this work. Please join me in welcoming her to Trent, her inaugural talk tonight as part of the Roberta Bondar Fellowship is titled, Licho Denny, Monitoring the Land. <laughs> 